So um, I did the dumb thing as the Lancer Dungeon Master and gave one of the players a Manticore session one. And, you know, uh, with no one else in mechs, the player just said castigate the enemies of the Godhead and self-destructed and killed the whole party. So I, I guess the session's canceled. Um, not really sure what to do now. Uh, neither I nor any of the people listening, I think, will have any fucking clue what you are talking about right now. But No, it's fine. Okay. I, I said self-destructed killed the whole party. It's fine. Also, is it is it a dungeon master? In what do they call it? Do they just say GM? I think they just say GM. I think it's just game master. Yeah, they didn't come up with any cool fancy lingo for game master. I thought is it you or Sam that hates the weird fancy lingo? Um, I hate the fancy lingo. Um, I I default to not liking the fancy lingo unless it fits really well. Then I'm OK with it. So, like, I don't mind Master of Ceremonies in Apocalypse games because it was a there's a very specific choice about why they went with that phrase. And like the MCDM RPG, the Game Master is being called the director. And I think that's a really good one. So I'm OK with that. But the uh, White Wolf games call it a storyteller. And that one can go fucking kick rocks. <laughs> Why? Oh my god! Don't use that fucking. But no, stop. Story I think you shit enough in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> what? Kick rocks. That's like oh. a weirdly southern insult. I didn't think that southern specific thing. I thought that was just an American thing. But okay. Um, I I literally never heard it until I came. Like, I mean, I heard it in like media, but I didn't hear it in actual like verbiage until I came to Texas. Weird. Okay. Interesting. Uh, either way, point being, Storyteller is a dumb name for a GM, and I hate it. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's any other ones that I've come across that I thought were really fucking stupid. Nothing coming to mind. I'm sure there's some other ones. I feel like I can't think of it. Not right now. Storyteller is the one that makes me the most mad. Hmm. Because it, it just makes it sound like the players don't matter. <laughs> Like, hey, you're just telling your own story. The players are just sitting there listening to you. You're just doing musical theater, apparently. <laughs> I mean, it makes a lot of sense for the, you know, theater kid vibe that fucking I mean, yes, uh, the White, White Wolf, Wolf games yes. slash Paradox Interactive have going. Yes, I mean, the White Wolf. I, if I remember correctly, the people who made the original company were all like novelists and playwrights. So, yeah, it makes so much sense. It hurts. <laughs> yeah. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that is what I've heard. I, uh, I speaking of White Wolf, I was just watching some stuff on it today while I was driving around, and um, I just I watched the like uh, <coughs> the Brava Alpha Busa like temp Emperor TTS guys doing their like introduction to White Wolf games, and they have this really goofy ad read about like thirty five minutes in <laughs> about a game shop in Wisconsin. He's like, look at this knight. He wants to kill you, but he won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's like this look at this knight. He is sworn fealty. He wants to kill you, but he won't. It just I don't know, it just activated neurons in a weird way for me. Alright. Alright. It has big banana rotate energy. It just banana. takes up the same part of my brain. Banana go. <laughs> That's, that's my favorite. We have to we have to compile that like sacred vault of like all time memes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the group meme bangers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, mm, interesting. It's like idea. the ones that have uh, have stood the test of time. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of those. It's like banana rotate. A lot of those red would bank be vines. Ape strong together. Yeah, I miss vine. I miss and other like associated vines. You need some milk. I feel like uh, honor honorable. Oh, he mention. needs some milk. <laughs> <laughs> honorable mention. Uh, <laughs> the uh, is that a police? I'm calling the weed. <laughs> oh say my that god, one that one's fuck. That's old. I say that one a lot. Uh, is that you a weed? Do, yeah. I'm calling the police. Like both versions. Also, <laughs> uh, side note: this is. We'll get there to the topic eventually, but so, <laughs> side note, the amount of times I will out loud in public be like a f an avocado, thanks, and people just look at me 
Like, what the <laughs> fuck are you on about? Okay, to be fair, though, that's the same energy as you and me doing the, like, suffer. Suffer like G did. And suffer everyone like else G did. Like, like, eight fucking heads. And we're like... God damn it, why did none of you play House of the Dead too? <laughs> it's such an obscure, stupid reference. And it's not even the line that he says, it's the way he says it that made it funny. So if you just hear someone yeah. say it, it doesn't even make any sense why it's funny. No, Suffer it, it, like, like the, G the, the best follow-up is the, you'll pay for this, Goldman. Yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, yep. Oh, House of the Dead. It, Old bad. If anyone's curious acting. what we're talking about, that one up. Just look up "suffer like G did." You'll, it'll come up immediately. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't. And if you didn't play House of the Two on either arcade machine or the fucking Dreamcast on a light gun, your childhood sucked, fam. I don't Damn, know. What to tell Dreamcast you. on a light gun. That's crazy. If you didn't, if you don't know the joy of re 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 reload, re 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 reload, <laughs> reload, reload. I, I just don't know what to tell you. All right, well, <laughs> to get onto the actual joy. topic, as we've kind of hinted at, or as I kind of hinted at, or, de you know, just explicitly said, it's going to be about uh -huh, Lancer. Uh -huh. um, well, the title will tell More me. specifically, my first impressions running it, um, finishing my session one, and general thoughts on the system now that I've got a little bit, emphasis on a little bit. So we're calling this a very highbrow, very formal review, right? Absolutely not. No, not even close. <laughs> this is like I dipped my pinky into the sauce and took a lick. Like, mm, tasty. Oh, not in, into mm. the, like into the pot that everyone's gonna eat from, or like your own. Oh, like, no, look, the chef always has to sample the meal. Ah, uh, you know? no, not right in the pot. Hey, my hands are clean. Are they? I, yes. Uh, look, I'm. When it comes to cooking. I'm that person, you know, like you've seen that video where like Wash it's like every cut. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's me. And I, I don't just I don't just do like the little the little like Italian fingies under the water. No, like I full soap my hands up pretty much anytime I finish it, finish the task. My hands are spotless while I'm cooking. I mean, it, do um, it doesn't actually matter. The sauce is coming up to a boil. Any germs you're putting in there are dying. <laughs> no, I know, but I just don't like I, I don't like having gross hands. Especially when you're working like meat or eggs and you just got that slimy feeling that just even if you do use just slaughter, it doesn't come off. Uh, you know, no, 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 not going to. Never mind. Nothing. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. I judged no. that was a hard dodge. <laughs> I, I felt that tension come out. I'm not going to. I was about to say some, <laughs> some hate of shit. I'm just going to not. Mm. Uh huh. <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> No, go on. Keep the joke going. Keep, no. the, keep the Josh just makes rampant sex joke going, please. <laughs> no, see, I didn't even say anything and you immediately knew where I was going. No, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> the second you uh, you said slimy, I was like, God <laughs> fucking damn it, bro. <laughs> I'm sorry. But you don't know which to. Never mind. We're done with this. I'm <laughs> I have, I've, you know what? I've got about three estimates. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple directions. Each of them worse go. than the last. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> Nobody, let's just none, none of y'all heard. I, I would say edit that out, but we're not gonna. <laughs> no, we're not gonna. Also, Brett doesn't do take a request. Like Brett, once in a blue moon, will take a request to do a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we actually get into a proper, given that we're ten minutes in, uh, Josh, do the thing. <laughs> If you want to hear about weird old memes that we bring up way too often and maybe sex jokes, I don't know. Uh, follow or subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. Also, tabletop stuff. I guess we do that. We do that. Once in a blue moon. <laughs> in a, yeah, once in a blue moon. Uh, so, I, I, you know, to start off, I, I have to set the scene that this is that Set Lancer, despite being a very crunchy game in its mech combat, that's only about half of the system. The other system is very narrative first, sort of improv yes ending going on, a la, you know, um, Pirate by the Apocalypse, Blades in the Dark, Fantasy Flight, whatever. Yes, what the, the, the pilot portion of the game is much more of a fiction first game style of game but as soon as you get into the mech combat you turn into the much more 5e mechanics first type of game which is intriguing yes uh i don't know if it's good or bad but it's intriguing 
It's definitely interesting, but therein sort of lies problem. My first issue. Uh huh. Um, and it's not really with the game itself. It's I am struggling to pull myself out of the five E mentality for running the game, and I, it's it's really hard to switch that initial gear. Like I'll give you a perfect example. Um, Lancer doesn't have skills. Yeah. Like typically they have triggers, which are more of like vague archetypes for doing oh, things. For context, but uh, you. Uh, just real quick, just because it is worth it. Uh, I have not played Lancer, but I did read a good chunk of the book, so I have some ideas about the... I, or I, I know how a lot of the general systems work. Uh, so I'm not completely <laughs> talking out of my ass here for anyone who's curious. Um, and yes, the triggers are... Uh, a couple of different games I've come across have used a similar system, and I don't know how to explain them very well because they make they make perfect sense. I just don't know how to describe them, but they're like phrases or words that you put down on your character sheet and they impart a bonus of some value. And that bonus is imparted when the phrase or word is relevant to the situation. Uh, so, you know, in like a D&D context, I guess the best way, I don't know if you have a better analogy, but is like, D&D has the athletic skill, so if you want to, uh, you know, pull uh, pull open like a stuck door, like the barbarian wants to lift the door off the hinges or whatever, you'd say an athletics check. If you were to turn it into a Lancer trigger style thing, it would be like, uh, I am mighty and, sh- and, you know, I am mighty and I break things would be the like phrase for the trigger. And then whenever that's relevant, you would get your skill bonus that you would get from the like, quote unquote, athletics check. So it's like, oh, GM, may I use my trigger because I am being mighty as I try to break this door? And the GM's like, yeah, sure. Take your trigger bonus. <laughs> yeah, that's the best I can and, do explaining that one. <laughs> no, that's pretty solid. Um, and that is kind of my first issue is that I'm thinking about them. There's so many triggers. Well, the, but there's also like there is an in- triggers. I mean, there's an infinite number of triggers because you can make your own and exactly. the game tells you to. Exactly. But that's also true. Yeah. Daggerheart. Yes, it is. Um, but because Lancer gives you about Suggested 20 ones. or so archetypes, my brain goes, treat those like skills. So in session, I was asking like, oh, uh, what 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 trigger makes the most sense for this? When I now realize that that's not that's not how that works. So a player says I want to do a thing and I would say make a skill roll, which is just a flat D20 with plus your grit. But at level zero, you don't have any. I'll talk about that later. Yes, it's a flat D20. And then or so there, there's sort of an equation. You want to do a thing. You describe how you do a thing. Yes. I is the dungeon master or game master tell you well step one you decide roll me a skill check you decide if it's even worth a roll at all yes well uh, something else i have to make um but assuming that's done i tell you to make a roll the way it should go is is a player should say and it it should be on the player's onus to do this which is oh well i'm trying to like the perfect example paladin wanted to blow up like a barrel like a like a gas canister you know the typical sci-fi shooter kind of thing yeah and I in in my eye where I fucked up was like, oh, roll a, a blow something up check. No, it's roll a skill check. And he goes, well, I have a plus two to blow something up. Yes. Do I add the plus two? Yeah, and yeah, then yeah, I say no, yes. Everybody does not have all of the triggers. Those are suggestions. But you only yeah. have the triggers that are on your sheet. The, the list does not matter. The list is only for the players to get ideas for character generation. Once the players have c- created their characters, you can ignore that list completely. Yes. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not a bespoke skill list for everybody in the game. Yeah, and I, I will have to, like, really push that tomorrow. Um, yes. Well, what you need. Yeah. Well, what I, you have I'm to trying do is to say. To... What? Oh, what, I, I'm, what I'm and I, I bring this up. I'll just shift this around. Uh-huh. Um, I don't really know how I'm going to do this. But I, I'm trying to figure out. Um, I'm trying. I'm struggling to get my players to ask more questions about the game and the situations within. Um, my players are, you know, I mean, Ant 
was a proactive player and Brett is mostly a proactive player. Um, but the others are very reactive. So now I have one semi proactive player and other more reactive into straight reactive players. I need to figure out and I'm struggling to figure out how to shift this. So they're asking questions because even in the other game in, in hellscapes, there was a lot of dead air while I was waiting for players to choose to do something. And then I have to play this song and dance where I have to ask each individual person what they want to do and try to explain the situation to them in different ways. I, I got to figure this shit out. Okay. Because I love my players and this is not a call out, but it is something that I'm struggling with. Well, it's, it's a, it's a call out. out of, it's a call out of one of their habits, whether it's good or bad. Isn't really the point. It's a call out of a habit. Yeah, I guess uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Uh, well, so two, two, two separate things, but this is, I, I've talked about one of these before. Um, in terms of the, like, the way Lancer and the triggers stuff interacts and getting the players to utilize them and getting that straight in your brain. Basically, the, 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 the um, you know, the process should always be GM, I would like to do X. And then you say, okay, this is worthy of a role. Make me a skill check. And then if the players are not prompting, then you have to say, okay, make me a skill check. Do you have any triggers that you think might be relevant? And that will force them to look at their triggers. And the hope is after doing that for a couple of weeks, they will start instinctively looking at their triggers when they go to try and do something just about out of habit because you keep asking them every time you do a skill check, do you have any relevant triggers to apply to this? Uh, mm -hmm. That's how you want to handle the trigger situation is basically just keep beating them over the head with it until they start naturally doing it instinctively. Uh, in terms of getting your players to ask questions, you cannot force people to give a shit or force people to ask questions. That's not actually a thing a GM can do. And a lot of GMs run into this problem where they're like, I don't understand. My players don't care or I, or they're not they're not trying to dig into what I'm presenting before them. And my response to you is you cannot make them care and you cannot make them dig into the scenario any more than they want to. So the way you deal with that problem is you simply keep the th keep the game rolling until they get interested or have no choice but to do something. And what I mean by that is, and this is one of this, this is one of those things that like newer GMs in particular, this is one of their, this is one of the biggest things I see with new GMs that like, uh, this is like a, their biggest struggle, I guess is the best way. Right? What? Try this. Yes. Yes. The big, one of the biggest struggles I see with new GMs is this idea of pacing and keeping the momentum going. And this is where you have to do that thing where you don't say you say it's a it's a tightrope because you don't want to be a dick about it, but you have to be a little bit of a dick about it. Kind of like you know how a teacher, if, if you're not getting something, has to be a little bit of a dick about it to help you understand sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of that. So if you say to the players, let's use your classic, you know, uh, the classic scenario, except instead of a tavern, it'll be a space bar. Players, you're sitting down in the space bar. Uh, you know, everybody, you're all having a drink. You're sitting there, you're chatting. Uh, you're between jobs and, uh, you know, you're waiting. Someone is supposed to show up soon to, uh, you know, give you the next job or give you the details. And you say, what are you guys doing? What are you up to? If you just get crickets in response nobody says anything nobody does anything in particular a lot of gms will go okay i'm now going to ask every individual player directly so i am forcing the player to answer my question don't do that it's not going to work because if they didn't want to answer the question in the first place they're not going to want to answer it when you ask them more directly they're going to because they're going to be like feel the pressure but they don't want to most of the time so instead, what you say is if nobody really says anything, nobody is nobody uh, takes the bait, as it were, uh, when you say, what are you guys up to? You simply move things forward. You say, OK, nobody. So you say, players, what are you up to? None of the players really say anything. Oh, one, maybe one player says, oh, I'm sipping my beer and scowling or something, you know, something fucking benign as shit. You go, OK, 
uh, you all sit and hang around and you just start going. You all sit and hang around for five minutes or so. Uh, you know, the crowd is rather rowdy right now. Um, uh, but, you know, it's it's the kind of bar that you would expect this level of rowdiness. But you do see one particular table that's getting especially loud. And then you start describing how they're getting into this fight. And then you say to the players, uh, you see as two of the two of the guys get up and start just like throwing hands at each other. They're going at each other. Uh, you see there's a third person involved in the situation, but is not directly in the fight. But they seem concerned about the fight. And, uh, players, what do you do? The players are like, yeah, we don't care. We're not going to. And they don't respond. They don't interact. They're like, OK, the players could uh, you guys continue to watch the situation until you realize that the third person who's trying to break up the fight is the person who's supposed to be here giving you the job. And there's a good chance they get quite badly injured in this situation. And it will be absolutely your fault, or at least people will think it's your fault. Uh, if this person gets injured in this situation and you just keep pushing them and you move the narrative forward, whether they do something or not, because eventually either a they're going to care and in and start, you know, uh, interjecting in the situation or B, you keep pushing the situation until they have no choice but to respond because it's directly like threatening and or coming at uh, coming into conflict with them one-on-one -on -one. you know like they have no choice essentially unless they just want to let their character sit there and like do nothing and get punched in the face i guess hmm. you just don't you just don't whenever there's those gaps in air and it seems like okay nobody's gonna do anything nobody cares you just keep moving forward like you just keep the narrative moving and in the sense of like uh kind of like the apocalypse world front concept everybody take a shot of uh, the way you set up fronts in Apocalypse World is what would happen to these various situations in the world if the players did not interact with the situation? And then you plan out those steps. And if the players do not interact or step into that front, then it moves forward. And you just, as the GM, move it forward. And you narrate how that happens. And if the players see what's going on, then you narrate the part that they see. And if they don't see, maybe an NPC tells them about it in the background or something. You know, small scenes are essentially the same idea. You keep moving that narrative forward and you think to yourself, logically, where would this go if the players don't interact? And then using the example that I just gave of the players in the bar watching the fight happen, if the players just do nothing, then the person that was supposed to give them the mission, maybe they get killed in the bar fight, like somebody fucking stabs them or something. And now the players are in deeper shit than they were before because they decided to just kind of sit there and do nothing. You know what I'm saying? You got what I mean? Yeah, no, I get you. It's like a, a lack of responsiveness means you got to put put the put them to the fire just a little bit more. Because you know, you just especially especially if you have players who are more reactive individuals like they don't ha they don't they don't feel compelled uh, to say or do something without being prompted, then you just need to prompt them more. Right. Like, OK, so if you're not going to do anything unless I look at you directly, then I'm going to look at you directly more often. You know, like I know player Y uh, is not going to get involved in a fight unless they are directly threatened. So I'm just going to directly threaten them because I want them to get involved in this fight. So I'm going to come straight after them because I know they're going to they'll they'll be more reactive than proactive. Gotcha. I'll have to try that. It's, it's not like to say that it's annoying is kind of a step too far because it's, it's, it's not frustrating. It is it can. Yeah, it's frustrating when, you know, I, I you know, <clears throat> especially when it's like a new system for me as well. I'm not quite in the rhythm of of describing and sort of setting the scene at my best. Uh, I was way better at that in Hellscapes where I made the setting and things were a lot more. They came more naturally. Um, also, I was with, like a completely different mindset, right? Like hard sci-fi is very different than post-apocalypse. One is like, oh, we have to get papers to people. And the other is like, hey, I'm just going to call someone on my cell phone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the tone of different um, genres is going to change the the way you sort of narrate and present things. Hmm. 
That just kind of um, is how it is. <laughs> fuck. Wait. Oh, damn it. I said, um, and I had a thought, and then you said something, and my brain went, no, that, wait, what's he saying? And now my, my thought's gone. Didn't say anything important. <laughs> no, I know. It doesn't matter. The thoughts. Although I will gone. say, in terms of <laughs> describing things, uh, you do have, I think, you have more information about that than I think you're giving yourself credit for, because <clears throat> as a big Gundam nerd playing the game that pulls heavily from Gundam, I think you got a lot of, uh, you know, sauce to pull from. That's true. Well, yes, I mean, I mean more of like describing the internals of a ship and shit like that. Where it's like, oh, I mean, stuff that even I don't have a lot of information of. Like, so to set the scene, yeah. the players are on a transport ship that got attacked by pirates. They are in a, a uh, uh, like a civilian cabin that that acts kind of like a big strip mall. Like merchants and people will like trade and do stuff there on the ship. Sure. Yeah. Um, and they got attacked from both sides. Um. And I, in what, in my head, right? I, I did, I literally did the three by three rule. I had the the three situations being, um, the main room, a sort of hallway, uh, you know, like that, that the sort of like labyrinthine ship hallway thing, and then like the main combat room, and the three situations that I had thought of to get from point A to point B because they're trying to get out of the main civilian cabin to get to the printing room get their mechs right i was like oh well maybe they can check the vents or try to forcefully breach the door open um or just fight their way out and they did breach the door open but i i, I knew that there was like you know the the james bond going through the vents kind of thing i had that but i i feel like i didn't set the scene enough to where the players could think about trying to look for something like that they did try to find something but this leads into another issue i have which is how skill checks work in lancer mainly at low level but more you know broadly across the board that the players were consistently failing in the situation that they succeeded in i felt like they couldn't reasonably reasonably do in hindsight so i was thinking about you know just saying it doesn't work anyway but that feels shitty, so I ended up not doing that, but it kind of angled my wires. You know what I mean? Wait, you tang you tangled your wires because they were so, failing and you were having trouble like explaining and, and setting up the layout of things? Yes, because like it, you know, the layout I feel like is very uh, important to a situation where there's a lot of things going on at once. Um, you know, like characters are being like handcuffed with guns in their faces and shit. And half the players want to fight. Half of them want to escape. So I'm trying to set up this scenario so that they can all see it with, you know, no physical map to show them. It's all theater of their mind. Um, the wires bit gets crossed and I'll explain this now is, uh, as standard, all skill checks in Lancer, have a set DC. RDC 10. Right. Yeah. I remember that. It's 10. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are ways to make the DC harder or easier. Um, yes. There's well, the... actually technically just harder. Um, Isn't there? Because you can make it risky and then heroic. Right. And I don't remember what the, the DC for heroic is. I think it's like 23 or it's high. But risky is DC 17. That's a huge disparity when you only have a flat d20 with maybe a plus two so i wanted i don't want to use that willy-nilly given that players have a 35 percent chance of hitting it you know right 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 no i mean no you definitely don't want to use that like uh or less they have a 15 percent chance something like that uh yeah i don't know I'd, ha I'd have to think about the math but yeah no you definitely don't want to just use that whenever um I thought I remember there being a way to modify in their favor, though, like give them an advantage of some kind. Am I not? They do. Yeah. So they have accuracies and then they have right. difficulty, which add so, a D6, add or subtract a D6, a D6 to the roll. Right. Yeah. 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 But there is no consistent way of doing that. And I, to be fair, I've read the rules for Lancer twice all the way through. Uh huh. But there's a lot of rules. Yes. So you you just miss shit, right? This is the whole. It's a textbook. Yes. Not a how-to guide. Right. Yeah. It's a textbook, um, not a not a novel you read from front to back. 
Yeah. So unless I missed it somewhere, the game kind of suffers from a similar problem that D&D does when it talks about handing out advantage and disadvantage based on narrative. Insofar as you can do it, but they don't give you examples of when it's relevant, right? And this happens a lot where players are like, DM, would this give me advantage? And the DM's like, nope. And then you go, so, well, what the fuck does then? I think you need to, well, again, I think you need to decouple from 5e because 5e in terms of advantage and disadvantage, yes, 5e mentions advantage. Uh, it mentions that you can hand out advantage and disadvantage as a... Um, as a sort of treat, as a reward, if the narrative makes sense. But the thing about advantage and disadvantage in 5e is it swings the math very heavily, for starters, because being able to pick the higher of two dies, uh, plus your modifiers and all that, is a you know is a big deal. Um, and mechanically. D&D gives player characters lots of ways mechanically to guarantee themselves advantage. You know, uh, you know, GM, I have the alert feat, so I get advantage on initiative, right? That's a guaranteed thing. You can't tell me no because I have the feat. So don't think about it. I know they use it feels like a similar system. It is not a similar. OK, I shouldn't say that. It is a similar system. It is not the same system. What you need to do with it in Lancer, as far as I remember from reading that section, it is intended to be a lot more liberally used fictionally because the players do not have a skill list. They only have their triggers, right? So already they are working on a flat DC 10 rolling a flat D 20. That's a 50 50 shot. So or is it a it's a 55 percent right? right? Or. No, 45? Is it the other? No, 10? 10 no, counts. 50%. No, 10 counts, so it's a... F- oh. Right, to the 10 counts, 55, so yeah. it's a 55, right? That's how that works? I forget. Yeah. doesn't matter. Hopefully. It's close to 50-50. That's kind of what matters. Right. You're, you're, the you're point being, to- you're in the 50-50 range. So, you have to be... You're in the 50-50 range, and you don't have a bespoke skill list. So what ends up happening is... And you don't have a moving DC of any kind... So you need to be a lot more liberal with accuracy and what do they call it? Deficiency or whatever. What's the other one? Uh, difficulty. <laughs> difficulty. I. That's right. That's right. I remember hating that they use the word difficulty and accuracy because those two things are not <laughs> not simpatico yeah. at all. They're not diametrically opposed. Yeah. No. Like. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be more liberal with it. Um in order for the players to get a better chance. And you have to realize that a D six on top of the roll is not as influential as two D 20 take the better, right? Two D 20 take Mm -hmm. the better is a much is more mechanically influential in terms of the math than adding a D six to your D 20 roll. So it's okay to hand it out more liberally. And I think the game again, it's been a minute since I read it, but as far as I remember from reading that bit, the game does intend for you to use it more liberally so the two things you have to do is a you as a gm look for places to hand it out particularly at these lower levels where they don't have a lot of triggers and if they're especially if they're not in their mechs when they're in their mechs it's a different story right because they have more reliable they don't have a skill list but they have um the mech stat bonus thingies whatever those i forget what those are called but they have the like set bonuses um, right? Am I remembering that right? Uh, grit. Yeah, no, not grit. the grit. No, the the mechs uh, have bonds? like. No, the mechs oh, themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. have stats that when you do stuff with the mechs, they add a bonus like a skill does. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Stand by. Uh, they're called. I forget what they're called. But uh, point being, at lower levels, have an emergent moment. Watch. <laughs> at lower levels, when they are out of their mechs, called mech skills. Mech skills. Okay, yeah. So they're they they're not in their mechs and they're lower level. So they're going to have less triggers. The triggers are going to be less influential. So you have to be more liberal with advantage and disadvantage to sort of help them along in the situation. Um, and the, the basically the way you're going to do the two ways that I would do that is a you as a GM try and look for spots where you're like, oh, I will give you advantage for this. Like try and nudge them and be like, yeah, you get advantage for this. 
and try to encourage them to try and argue for advantage. Like, you know, you want them to be like, oh, uh, GM, I, you know, there's dudes on the other side of the room. You know, uh, the door opens and I start opening fire. And you're like, okay, make a skill check. And they go, oh, wait, wait, wait. If I take cover behind the door frame and shoot from the door frame, can I have advantage on my shooting at the bad guys roll? And you go, yeah, you can have advantage for that, right? Like, you want to try and encourage them to fish for it a little bit. And the way you're going to encourage that is by you offering it, you know, uh, anywhere where you think it makes sense, like something's happening, you go, oh, if you do this, I'll give you advantage for it. And then, you know, you're kind of putting the seed in their brain. Especially because it's a new system, so they probably don't know, you know, what, like, they don't know what they can vie for that might get them an accuracy. And as we said, when you're out of the mechs and you're just on the pilot level, the game is much more fiction focused. And a game that is more fiction focused is a game where it makes sense to hand out something like accuracy or difficulty more liberally for the fiction because the game cares more about the fiction. Yes, I'm you're, listening. I see, I see. You, you're, you know, you're operating in a dip, uh, you're, it's, <laughs> Lancer's a weird one because half of the game you're operating in is a very different style of game than your players are used to because as far as I'm aware, none of your players have played any sort of Forged in the Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse style stuff. Um, you, With the exception we, of Brett, yes. Yeah, okay. And... So that is weird. And then the other half of the game, they're going to be in like D&D combat land. And they'll be like, oh, this makes sense. <laughs> uh, so that's funky. But right, you know, while you're operating in that fictional space that they're not as used to, you're going to have to nudge them in the right direction. Or at least, you know, I'm going to uh, <laughs> wish me some more fucking luck on that front. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, you know, try your best, at least can't I mean, guarantee anything. It would be helpful uh, if you had a player who is more used to that style of game in the group. Yeah, you know, like, um, <laughs> like if if I were in that game, and you know, because I understand that I could nudge the other players. You know what I mean? Like that would definitely help you. Yeah, I mean, but I, you got to work with. What you I'm got. not gonna lie, I, that has crossed my mind. Um, what uh, me being like, you know, dropping the player count from six to five and kind of hard stancing that may have been not the wisest idea in hindsight because all my players are new to it to the system and the style of system but for, oh, we're gonna run it see what happens i mean worst comes to worst i'll i'll bump that back up to six and just we'll figure it out from there uh i mean i don't know that more players will necessarily help though no but you know i i could have had someone like you oh you're saying in. oh okay yeah I mean, yeah. maybe. Yeah, maybe. I didn't actually. Like I said, I, worst comes to worst, I'll, I'll. I didn't realize you reduced your your group number size. I well, it was kind of out of necessity. Um, Ant is no longer playing. Uh, no bad blood or anything. He just seemed generally uninterested to play a mech game. So it just kind of is what it is. Um, I see. And I was not too interested in, in doing the the American Idol uh, you know talent lineup if you will <laughs> right. and just kind of also I'm not going to lie there's quite a few people who wanted to play Lancer and I there was no universe where I felt good picking one person over other people who wanted to play you know oh, what I mean yeah I mean that's a whole that's its whole own can of worms so yeah yeah I pretty much I just sent out the, I sent out the, the, the business mass email of like uh, I'm sorry. The the position has not been filled. We it's no longer in the budget this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The position has been uh, removed. In fact, actually, we just uh, took it out of the company. It was draining. Um, it was draining our funds. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm I'm gonna shoot for it, and and hopefully, it. Uh, well, shoot for it is in like I, I'm gonna do the things that we talked about today, and, and hope things kind of start shifting around a bit. I mean, it, it uh, takes time to, to feel out the, the groove uh, of a new game. You know, the only the, the important thing is are. Uh, 
are your players trying to get into that new group? That's the important thing. You know? Yeah. Because if they're just kind of sitting there with their proverbial dicks in their hands, then it doesn't matter what game you play. <laughs> you know? Yeah. On a brighter note, uh, uh, because it seems like I'm dogging on the system, I'm really not. It, it really should say a lot that I only have two real issues with this. of the With the entire game, I've got kind of two well, issues. Also, right? with I don't, the narrative side. I don't think any of the issues you stated really had anything to do with the game so much as just friction of your true. players running up against the game. True, true. Um, Which is normal. Something I do really like, though, is the equipment system, baby. <laughs> Everyone take a shot. Of course. <laughs> y'all knew this was coming. Um, no, the... the, the the gear system in this game is really cool because it, it it much like everything in Lancer, it works on two fronts, right? You have pilot gear and mech gear. I'm specifically going to be talking about the pilot gear because I've had more introduction to that. Mech gear is just kind of what it is, right? It's like weapons and rockets and guns and shit. That's less interesting. A lot of the really cool stuff comes from the actual chassis themselves and the bonuses they have, right? Like you can equip a jump jet to to like your Everest or whatever, but right. that's just something that the Everest get. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just <laughs> the Sonic R soundtrack just came on in my playlist, and it activated literally all of my neurons, and it took every fiber of my being to not just start singing the song <laughs> into the mic. Well, mission failed on that on that front. I did. I didn't start singing it. I but, <laughs> but no. But you did bring it up. <laughs> I did bring. You don't, dude. You do not understand. My entire body locked up for a second. <laughs> I went into full short circuit on that one. Oh my god. Anyway, uh huh. The pilot gear is really cool because it does the exact thing that I really liked in Fantasy Flight, which is. It says it does a thing, it does that thing. But it also allows for extrapolation outside of it. And save for certain things, they just happen, right? Paladin's character has like a cloaking suit. And it just it, it doesn't say it gives you bonuses to stale thing. Stale thing? To stealth thing. Stale. It doesn't it doesn't do the DD thing. It just says you are invisible. And to me, because it's a narrative first game, that's where it ends. You're invisible, especially in the, where my players were last session, which is a zero G environment. You don't make fucking footsteps, <laughs> you know? Right. So for all intents and purposes, you're just gone. And he went about doing the solid snake where your friends stabbing them in the throat before they could answer. And that was really cool. And the only thing it says is you're you can turn invisible, you turn un you you decloak if you take damage, and it's got about 30 minutes of operational time. That's awesome. That's that's more than enough to cover any given scene, if not two. That gives you plenty of time to do all the cool stuff you want, and it in the game just puts it up to you to go. Invisibility in this situation would would go however you need it to go. I love that. Um Another thing that I really, really like, and it's it is a complete nothing burger item. It you could make a solid argument that it's actually a waste of an item slot, but I love it, and all my most of my players picked it, which is having a sound system that you can install into your mech, and it's very specifically pilot gear. They talk about it like it's like a like an iPod with speakers, and or a headset, and Got it. uh. It doesn't say, right, that you can't communicate with other pilots without a sound system. Nowhere in the rules does it say that. In fact, the game specifically says the only situation in which you cannot communicate with other pilots when they're in mechs is if your mech is jammed. And that's only it. All it says is your comms are jammed. It doesn't say that your you know, your character can't do like sign language or shorthand code like most military do, you know? Um, what it does do is it gives you another layer of guarantee and it gives your players some cool flavor stuff to be like, you know, I'm where, you know, where we drop in boys plays Thunderstruck by ACDC, stuff like that. <laughs> um, 
It just it, it's just got infinite uses. And in uh, honestly, my head canon has just been that's how the play that's how the characters are listening to all the cool music I uploaded to World Twenty <laughs> is through their collective sound systems. <laughs> right, of course, reasonable assumption. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the weapons are cool too. Uh, the weapons follow. Uh, it seems kind of archaic, which is kind of funny, or not archaic. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Unintuitive at the start, because all weapons are categorized into three specific subcategories. You have archaic weapons, AC weapons, and signature weapons. Um, archaic is just basically a sword, like a normal steel sword, or like a pickaxe, or something. Pretty much anything that goes from like standard military kit to improvise weapons. Those are archaic items. AC, which is alloy composite, is anything that's made in like the modern century, which is the as far as it's not actually the 51st century, but it's the second. It's more probably like closer to the 12th, like yeah, the 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 12,000th century or, or millennia, something like that. Uh, it's just how recorded time works in Lancers. It gets wacky after the fifth apocalypse. Uh, <laughs> the fifth it, apocalypse? It's based, what is this, fucking 14? Oh, yeah, no, l- yes, yes, that's literally the whole thing with Lancer is humanity has gone through so many apocalypse level scenarios that they finally got their shit together. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, the main difference is archaic weapons do less damage, have less range, and cannot hurt mechs. AC weapons can hurt mechs. Now, there's no reason why you would take an archaic over an AC for any other reason other than flavor. I'm not really sure why they offer it to you other than just to do it. Um, Shrug. To uh, to do some kind of scenario where it's like we're trapped on some backwater planet and we don't have our good equipment. I could see that. Yeah, that, that's fair. Um, oh, and I then signatures. See is something else you can just take (laughs) and that has something it's got something called variable range which is it could be like a bloodborne trick weapon basically but it's still ultimately up to you what it looks like and how it works and you can pretty much freely take it however you want did did you ever play the star ocean games i did not i know what star ocean is but i've not played it oh okay all right so in star ocean till the end of time which is star ocean two or three i don't remember um, that's kind of the premise is your characters from like, you know, modern sci-fi planet and you end up on podunk nowhere town and fantasy land. And it's just funny because you like have a cool sword and they're like, whoa, that's a crazy sword you got there. How'd you make it so nice? And you're like, uh, <laughs> it just made me think of that. Mm. But also the first weapon I think you get in that game is a lead pipe. So, you know. Also, uh, I similar, similar, you'll like this, similar to Amaro Ray, uh, the main character is good at what he's doing because he played a video game a lot and read the manual. Nice. <laughs> yes. So he knows how to fight. Truly. <laughs> because, because the games in that universe are like uh, a Star Trek Hollow Deck that you play in. So he knows how to fight from mm. playing the video game. <laughs> so, okay. I, I got to talk about this. Uh, because you brought up Amuro Ray, and it is kind of related to Lancer, and it actually does lead into a separate point that I have um, that actually leads kind of back to the skill thing, being uh-huh. the f- 55, 45, whatever, uh-huh. is that the game says that Lancers are basically spec ops. They specifically say you are not infantry, you are hyper specialized armored cavalry. Yeah. Cavalry being more specialized units. Yeah. The fact that you're at, at the lowest level failing potentially 45% of the time kind of goofy game i'm just saying i i but i i did i did pick up on that when i was reading through and felt a little confused about that yeah there's there's some ludo narrative disco biscuits going on about that yeah um so on to talking about best boy and but not best voice actor boy amaro ray <laughs> um, oh, because his voice that. actor whoo baby don't do him like that uh did you hear all the shit his voice actor got into Oh, oh, I thought I thought you meant like his voice acting quality. What is his voice actor got into something? What do you mean? Got into. Oh, baby. Um, So gotten into an affair with random woman, um, you know, uh, random woman got pregnant. He uh, all but forced her to take care of the situation. Uh. And this did a, you know, got physical a lot of, it's crazy. 
and is now going to court for it. And yeah, uh, one of the most popular voice actors of all time just wrapped up in this fucking eightfold conspiracy of nonsense. Did he hit her with I am this not dude's the father? This dude's career fucked. Huh? I said, did he hit her with I am not the father? No, he just hit her straight up. Uh, oh, I, I, I didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, it, it's bad. Yeah, it, 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 it. He went full gaslight gate girl, gatekeep girl boss about it. It's bad. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Damn. Alrighty. Well, it could have been worse. I mean, uh, that's okay. That's I shouldn't say that. It could have been worse. Is the like could have been you know arrested for doing terrible terrible things that i will not mention on podcast but yeah. it's very bad still um all of that to say to an earlier point is i uh-huh. i kind of laugh because i watched gundam seed as everyone I, i've probably told at this point that like listen to this regularly who's our friends the main character of gundam seed they try to make you like oh he's just like amuro ray he's just kind of figured it out no the fuck he didn't no, he didn't. His college had mobile suit piloting classes, of which he is an <laughs> ace, according to everybody. And he's a master level programmer somehow. And he gets into his Gundam and goes, this operating system is dog shit. Hold on, I'm going to rewrite it real quick. And he does. He rewrites the entire Gundam OS in like a minute, like straight 60 seconds, and then gets up and pilots it like an ace. He is not similar to Amuro Ray at all. <laughs> Kira is way better of a character than I gave him credit for about a month ago, but don't tell me he's not got some Mary Sue bullshit going on where he literally cracks knuckles and goes, I'm just going to rewrite it real quick. He's taking fire from other mobile suits as he's doing this. I mean, he did get gaslit gatekeep girl boss against himself, though. That was a thing that, you know, he, uh, he did. He, he, he did do it. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just I don't know. I they they really kept trying to pose Kira as the underdark, the underdark, the underdog at the beginning of the story, when he just clearly isn't. He's literally a superhuman in every meaning of the word, including having weird gene therapy. He's not an underdog. He's literally the coolest, most special boy. Shut up. <laughs> he did bang crazy. So he did, dude. I'm not gonna lie. Flay got a weird redemption arc in the last couple what? episodes, and I knew she was going to die. Uh, yes. Be- so she gaslit herself. <laughs> she gaslit herself into actually loving him in the end. It's insane. And the dude who she definitely cucked was like, you fucking gaslit yourself, didn't you? You actually care about him now, don't you? I don't even blame you. He's a great guy. I kind of love him, too. But you really fell for your own con. What the fuck is wrong with is you? This, Are you crazy? Is this, like, is this some liquid snake? I hypnotized myself to think my arm was controlling me type shit. Like what? No, it's just everything went wrong for her. Like her dad died. She slept with Kira. Kira was presumed dead. One of her friends actually died. There's an enemy aboard the ship and her mental state just degraded so hard to some sort of uh, some part of her inner logic system looped back and was like I do actually love Kira after all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then she dies and I'm not going to lie, I laughed really hard. I felt bad cuz I did like her at this point. Uh the main bad guy has a mobile suit with with funnels on it, right? And he shoots at her her like escape pod with the beam rifle. And the main Gundam, man, in the nick of time, manages to block it with its shield and like the, the fucking triumphant music plays. And then it cuts to a funnel that just snuck around the back and then shoots the pod and blows it up. Oh. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> I literally oh. stopped and was like, oh, my fucking God. <laughs> Damn, she got hit with the plea maneuver. Yeah, yeah, straight Zelgius mm, and interesting maneuver <laughs> like, and oh. just fucking clowned her. <laughs> it, dude, it was gr- it was. It was kind of glorious. I'm not gonna lie. Was it? Why were you bringing up Amaro and Gundam? Oh, you brought up Amaro. I, I, uh, what? Why were you bringing is, up Gundam? You well, said, you brought up Star Ocean, and then I know, pulled the Amaro Ray. You said that you said it was gonna relate back somehow, though. Oh, oh, it was just the fact that like read the uh, characters are supposed to be super cool at the beginning, and then aren't, and Kira is not that. I just had to laugh uh-huh. about that. He's he's just super cool from the start, except for his fashion sense, which is terrible, and his really dumb haircut. Yeah, uh, I mean, where am I in my notes? 
yeah, I don't know. But I mean, yeah, the the set DC being that weird swingy swingy, that weird swingy 50 50 situation is strange. I, I don't totally understand why they went with that, because like Shadow of the Demon Lord does the same thing. But Shadow of the Demon Lord gives you like set static bonuses that can, you know, be a bit higher and aren't like triggers where they have to be, you know, where they have to be relevant necessarily. So I don't know. I mean, they kind of do in like Shadow of the Demon Lord. It's like, oh, your agility is plus three. Make an agility check. You add three. But so they have to be relevant in that in the way that they do in D and D. But triggers are a little more specific than that. I believe the idea is that it's kind of doing the swinginess of five E, but on purpose. So as you become a veteran pilot, you know your grit goes up with every level. So you become basically unstoppable by the end when your grit is plus six. And if you have a trigger that goes with that, you're at a plus eight and the standard DC is 10. Right. Do plus you whatever always it, add grit for normal checks, though? I don't remember. I believe you do. Yeah, I think grit just becomes a standard thing you get. Um, I will check. I know you do for piloting. Uh, like, I, I know you do for mech stuff, but I don't remember if making like basic piloting pilot skill checks, if grit is like a static bonus you always have. Could be. I mean, uh, that's, I. I mean, that makes sense if the game said to you, your pilot, you know, your character is a shitty pilot to begin with, but they say you're not. So that's a little no. Weird. They yeah. They very specifically say you're not a shitty pilot. You're actually yeah. kind of a Chad. Yeah. Because you have to be to be a lancer. You can't right, be a right. lancer without being at least highly proficient in mechanized combat. Yeah. The game tells you you're a level uh, three D and D character when really you're a level one D and D character. <laughs> yes. Yep. That is strange. Oh no! Here we go. Uh, grit is half your character's license level rounded up, improves attack bonuses, hit points, and saves for both pilot and mech. So not skill. So it just though. is a yeah. Attack bon attack. You said attack saves and HP. Oh, hmm. So not skill checks. Maybe. I don't know. We don't. Uh, we, we're it. not. We're not going to try and live read this. So, it, it, sir, sir. Yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> we can't, we're it is something go I'm going to have to know. Right for, now. I mean, yes, for, for the right, future. Fair enough. Um, that's pretty much all I had to say about the pilot side stuff. I have way less to say about the mech stuff. Um, I mean, did you even do any Because mech I'm stuff? still not for... What was that? Did you even do any mech stuff in your first session? We did, yeah. So we're halfway through our first combat session. I have two planned for the session one bit. Uh, so I do have a little bit to say. Um, mech combat... And this is going to get a little oxymoronic in a second, but I would say at <laughs> least at the beginning, given that I'm engaging with the lowest level of mech combat right now, being licensed level zero across the board Everest, mainly characters using template Everest. I would say it's about on par with D&D &D in terms of its complexity. The main difference I feel like is that D&D &D does not give you all of your possible actions in the base. It tells you that they exist but it took a couple books before you got them. Things like shove, overtake, stuff like that. The game Lancer just tells you what all those things are and it puts them all on one page or a couple pages. And that's really daunting to get through, but they do sur summarize it all and basically say, these are all the actions you can take. These are what the actions uh, consist of in the action economy. Are they quick actions, full actions, reactions, what have you? You get a whole grid about it. That becomes super simple. That's really cool. I like that a lot. I like that they go, don't worry. We know this is kind of word soup. Here word you go. Soup. Here's your fun little table. Uh, okay. That being said, I definitely can see this getting really complicated later on when you can start mix and matching your mech licenses. And given that, and I didn't know this, I thought you were locked in. Once you bought for a license, you were locked into that license. So for like... For example, I thought you had to complete one license at a time to a maximum no. of three, uh, four licenses. No, you can just take levels of whatever the fuck you want whenever you want to take it. 
I'm like, I'm literally panning my hand across the screen. Like anyone can see this. <laughs> no, nobody um, can see it. <laughs> but good to know. Um, that being said, if you want a higher level thing for that license, you have to at least take one level and you have to dip it into it again, which does equalize. But there is a situation where you can have one license of this, one license of this, two licenses of this, one license of this, three licenses of this, and you just run it that way. I can see that getting kind of complicated because it's just free range multi-classing at that point. Yeah, yeah. It's. it's I don't think my players are going to go that hard, but I do know a couple people who want to guess who are absolutely going to go that hard. I'm yeah, looking at it, you, Walter, and that's his screen name, not his actual name. <laughs> that it is arguably worse multi-classing. I mean... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's uh. Also, you Kaiser, I'm looking at you too. All right. Well, you don't need to just like call people out necessarily. That's bad, rude. But too bad. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. I would, I would have to look at the system itself to get any kind of idea of what the fuck's going on there. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess you're just gonna have to figure that one out. Cross that bridge when I you am. get there. Something I will say that kind of, that does bug me about the game, and this is where the oxymoron comes in, is that there's way more shit to keep track of on, on any given turn in combat. Yes. Because uh, conditions are a lot more varied, and they play a lot more of a role in not just afflicting status conditions, but them being allotted based on positioning. So, for example... And this is pretty self-explanatory, to be fair. Um, kind of why I'm using it is when you engage with someone in an adjacent way, which is to say you are next to somebody on the grid, you are considered engaged with that person. And that that condition will toggle on and off based on your movement. And that condition controls things. For example, uh, range attacks automatically have one difficulty. I didn't actually realize that in last session. I, I kind of forgot about the engaged condition because my brain was so rattled with all the other shit I had to rattle me bones. Um, rattle me bones! So a player definitely got hit when they should not have gotten hit and I will have to redact that going into next session because it did a lot of damage. Um, but yeah, it, it's 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 becoming a lot to like keep track of and it will get easier with time for sure. But until I've sort of experienced the full breadth of it, it's just I feel like it's going to be like, oh god, oh geez, oh god, oh geez, what do I do? What the fuck? Oh shit, oh shit. <laughs> And slowly it'll get easier. I mean, it will get easier, but I don't know if it'll ever like there will be certain conditions that your brain will be that will just come up so often that you will just remember how they work. Right. But I don't know. I don't know if it's ever going to get to the point where you're like, ah, yes. And then this activates and then that activates and then this activate. Like, I don't think it's I, I think there's too much shit in there for it ever to be like a totally easy. Just boom, bag, boom, you know? Oh, bro. So I just I just checked the fuck. Oh, my God. This is kind of what I mean. So I just checked the hidden condition or the uh -huh. invisible condition. Yes. If you have anything turns invisible. So it says all attacks against invisible characters, regardless of type, have to have 50% chance of missing outright before the attack is even made. Roll a die or flip a coin. Okay. And if that counts as a miss, it's a miss outright. Yes. I don't know how I would have remembered that. I'm going to be real. <laughs> Especially I mean, like out of mech combat. That's not a particularly difficult rule, but it is a rule that doesn't really interact with any other kind of thing. So I can understand why you wouldn't remember it. Yeah, because it's kind of its own little pocket rule. Like it, it it's its oh, own yeah, mechanic it, that doesn't that doesn't tie back into any other mechanic, really. Yeah, there's also like the lock on, which is like it, it's a it's. So lock on is you have to make a lock on check. You have to make an E defense check to to lock on to somebody. And then now they have the locked on condition. And there are certain weapons like the Vijaya rockets or Yaja rockets. I can't remember what the, how the fuck it's pronounced. The, the ones that the morning cloak has. Um, the the, the Vagugu. Yeah, uh, I don't think you can actually attack with them unless you have lock on, which adds another level of complexity of like keeping track of what your lock on is. I do remember the lock on condition. I was like, oh, this is a hunter's mark that everybody gets, huh? OK. Kind is sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Something tells me I'm going to just have eight different iterations of the ComCon open at any given time, <laughs> as well, well as two iterations of the Lancer rulebook. 
I think what you want to do is make a, um, at least for like combat conditions, make a cheat sheet of some nature in roll 20 or something like that as like a handout. Mm -hmm. So you can look direct, just look at it all laid out in one list. If they are not necessarily laid out in one spot in the book. Yeah, I'll have to do that. Um, You also run into a weird situation where because there's a myriad of stats for the mech that serve similar but ultimately different purposes, things get a little wacky, right? Because all mechs have evasion and e-defense and armor and hull. And they all kind of do similar things, which is stopping you from taking a hit. But evasion is your ability to dodge. E-defense is your ability to not get hacked. Armor is the level of damage reduction you get when you do get hit. And hull is your ability to get shoved through a wall and your mech not crumple at the impact. With the, yeah, with the exception of armor, they're all kind of saving throws. Yeah. yeah the armor thing threw me for a loop because uh, I didn't. I forgot that pilots also have an armor rating. Uh. Yeah, I, I'm not regretting my decision to run Lancer, but I, I the. I thought I was gonna to have to deal with a lot less pre session stress. It's just, it's just more. <laughs> I mean, and that's I'm fine. A, I'm happy to do it, but it is I'm more a, stressful. I'm gonna be honest. I don't know why you thought it would be less. I I, I told you from the jump that this game is was was crunchy. It is yes. I because I I guess the idea was because Hellscapes was so unfinished. I had to make a lot of judgment calls on the fly and then keep track of those judgment calls when they would inevitably come up again a couple months later. Whereas I was like, oh, this book has so many things that I can just directly reference with the ComCon. But now I'm referencing so much with the ComCon that I'm like, oh, shit, I have to remember all these things so I, have to, so I can reference them less and speed things up. Uh, yes, sometimes actually having less information can be uh, to your benefit and having less mechanical specificity can be to your benefit because you as the GM can just make that call as you so desire. Uh, so even if you know you might get frustrated that there isn't a specific rule for a specifically weird thing, but if you just make the call and go with it, then you're fine. So yeah, it can be it can be to your disadvantage to have everything very specifically laid out. Uh, That's kind of my beef with Pathfinder, is that everything is very tightly and specifically laid out down to the like, you know, down to the every little minutia that could ever come up type rules. It's just, you know, grappling is a page and a half and it's just like, sometimes I don't uh, I don't want all this, Uh, you know, sometimes I just want to make a decision very quickly on spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see myself in in a moment being like, I know what the rules are. I'm just going to make a judgment call and you're just going to you as players are just going to have to be OK with that because it's a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, in terms of. um, Yeah, in terms of how to handle that kind of thing, yes, what you want to do is. <clears throat> make the judgment call in the moment as fairly as you possibly can write down a note, come back to it later, explain when it comes up again, this is the official rule. Uh, you know, I was making a judgment call the last time it came up, you know, that's, that's basically what you gotta do. Yeah. Which is true of any game. That's not a, that's not really a Lancer or any other specific system problem. That's just, that just is. Yeah. It just yeah, comes I mean, up like it comes up more with D&D games says like it answers. Yeah, I mean, it, it is one of the things where right, people argue this a lot about D&D, but I do I do enjoy and and, and I, I both do and don't enjoy the, the five E's being like at the end of the day, it is still ultimately up to the GM to make that call. The, the GM does have the right to go. I, I know what the rules are and I don't care. I'm making a judgment call. Yes. I mean, that's true of every game. I do enjoy that. At the end yes, of the day, but I feel like a lot of games are, I mean, and to be fair, <laughs> D&D is not as explicit with it as it probably could be because it's just one mention. Oh, my dog is barking. I'm going to pile drive him. Uh, D- 
D&D does make a specific mention of it where I believe it's kind of implied with other games. No, other games will say it. No, actually, in fact, it's pretty common for other games to say it pretty directly early on. It's just... I don't know. People put more emphasis on it with D&D, I think because the older editions of D&D maybe didn't really put as the same degree of emphasis. I'm not really sure. I don't really know. But plenty of other games say it. At the end of the day, though, it's one of those things that it is intrinsically true of every tabletop game because uh, the great con that tabletop designers have pulled on us is they have made me made us think that we need them when like we don't actually need them for anything. But, you know, we've agreed. We've agreed to the Stockholm syndrome. Because here's the thing. At the end of the day, you and your friends could sit down, describe some characters, come up with a single die resolution mechanic and just talk funny voices, roll funny clicky clack dice and play a whole fucking campaign like that and never, ever have a rule book of any nature. Just just do the thing, you know, like. So. Ultimately, every game's up to the GM <laughs> and the players. But that's getting into uh, weird game design philosophy stuff. <laughs> bit of a bit of a, a different rabbit hole. Yes, true. And one that I have neither the time nor the energy uh, as uh, people. You might not know this, dear listeners, but I'm just getting over like awful sinus infection and my face is still killing me. Just remove your face and get a new. You know what? Just for that, I'm going to hit you with the, the, the greatest line in Mass Effect Andromeda. I'm sorry, my face is tired. <laughs> not exactly what the line is, but yeah. Fair enough. Uh, close enough. Uh, Who actually remembers the terrible dialogue of that game? I, uh, that I'm watching that, like a four hour introspective on Andromeda and the guys like, I really cannot stress to you how terrible the dialogue in this game is. OK, hold on. I want to be clear. I want to be clear about it. Andromeda. Not all of the dialogue is ungodly terrible like that. That particular character who says that is weirdly awfully ri- like she's really bad. I don't know why. What the fuck's her name? Addison, I think. I don't know why she's so bad. Know. She fucking sucks. Uh, not every character is written like a trash fire like that. <laughs> Just say Like, actually, so they're I th- all bad, but she is real bad. No, they're not all bad. They're not all bad. I would say Drac, Vetra and um, uh, uh, what's his name? Jaw, I think are all written pretty well. PB's not great. Liam's a stick of wood. The the Salarian captain is a stick of wood. The weird religious co-pilot is whatever. <laughs> but there's a couple of good I ones. remember the weird. Yeah, he, he brought up the weird religious co-pilot. I thought She's it was strange. Funny. Like, oh, I, I were they just trying to recreate Ashley? But like, well, we can't do the racist thing again. I. I don't know what they were trying to do with her. She's just really Christian and really Scottish. And that's the only two things that seem relevant about her. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I really mm. don't <laughs> see. Yeah. And, you know, they were never going to top Joker, but they put a just hilariously uninteresting Solarian as the pilot. And I just it's like, man, you're you're a disappointment to Joker and Morden at the same time. I wow. Oh, I hate you. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like that Solarian was so like obviously, right? Like Morden is, is trying to tap into that Spock like uh that Spock brand of like humor and writing. But yeah, no, I like I think I think the thing that made Spock and, and Morden so great is that they aren't just kind of planks of wood they, they 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 sort of act like planks of wood but they aren't like sort of intrinsically to their character i mean morden is very explicitly not a plank of wood he's actually quite complicated he just pretends to be very uh like um blunt and straightforward because he's actually That's emotionally quite traumatized on the inside <laughs> mm. morden goes through a lot homeboy homeboy has a rough one <laughs> but you know Anyway, why are we talking about Mass Effect? <laughs> uh, because I am officially out of things to talk about. Okay. Do you have any final notes, final thoughts, final points, final? Um, 
Uh, only that if you're players, if you are players, please just ask questions. Just ask. Um, I know that you're like, well, what if I'm not interested in anything? I, I don't know. Um, but maybe at least just think about what you would, what your character is doing at any given moment. Like, you don't have to have an exact answer, but just sort of think about it in the back of your head while you are inevitably not saying everyone does this, but if you're the kind of player that just sort of stares off into space and disassociates for 20 minutes at a time, just, <laughs> just you do the dolphin thing and use half your brain, to <laughs> half your active brain cells to just keep track of what's going on. So you can be like, oh, I'm doing this. Because it's a, it's very demoralizing. If I sit there for two and a half minutes in complete silence when I ask people what they're doing. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it almost feels like you could have done a done a whole episode about this particular problem. I I can, and I I'm not gonna lie. I probably will at some point when I figure out how to word it in such a way that makes me feel like I'm not just shitting on my players. <laughs> Fair enough, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Because I, 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 you know, I, I do genuinely think my players are good players. It's just this one thing that's kind of a through line uh, throughout the campaigns that I run that just I see, I see, that doesn't quite grind my gears, but it does kind of like dishearten them. I mean, grind your, you could say grind your app description. Fair enough. Uh, all right, well. Fucking, that's been us, I suppose. Give us a follower on the old Twitter, the Twittosphere, the Twitter, the the Muskrat Incorporated, the Exoverse. Follow us on Twitter. Did you see that they like officially changed the domain to X? And I'm just, I'm just sitting here. This is the Tap and Z problem all over again. This is literally the Tap and Z thing. If you're yes, yes. from New York or spent time in New York, where it's like, I don't care what it's called. It's still Twitter. Oh fuck yourself. Suck a dick. I'm not calling anything else. Especially because X is a really bad name. Yes. At least the like. Cool yes, and if you rage. think X is a good name, you can eat my entire ass with a spoon. Oh. oh. Yeah. You got twenty four okay. hours. Okay. All right. I guess we'll close on that statement. Hmm. Ian gets it. That's his okay. joke. I'm not even gonna lie. Stole okay. it right from him. Yeah. All right. All right, well, uh, bye-bye now.